Hi there, everybody. Welcome back to Leading Our Own Way. We're up to part three of this week's episode of the show. We're diving even deeper into our conversation with this week's guest. Let's continue exploring their inspiring journey. If you've missed part one and two, definitely go back and catch up. Also, if you're not subscribing, please, please subscribe. Enjoy the rest of the show. See you soon. Well, I think it's critical, you know, I think getting up, having a couple of glasses of water, getting moving and uh, all of that um, uh, has a huge impact. If you're sedentary when you're waking and you're, you know, you're sitting up in your bed and you're mucking around on your phone for two hours before you, you know, roll into the shower and then go to work, I, I can't see how you could ever really be performing at your best, you know, yeah. or, or be entirely even happy with yourself. Yeah, I completely agree. And you, you, you've just, I'm, I'm so glad we're having this conversation today because you've actually kind of motivated me because until probably the summer holidays, as you know, I'm in education. So I had a long summer holiday and I was doing it perfectly. I was like, I'm in this for life now. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. Had six weeks off. I'm filming episodes of this all over summer, messes my routine up, come back. And I thought, oh, you know, I got into it pretty quick and I'm out of it. And I've yeah. done the last nine weeks, not getting up at quarter to half five, 20 past five, half past mm. five. Club, I, I, I've gone past cold showers now and I do cold plunges for three to six minutes. Go well down. Uh, yeah, I'm, you know, my water's sitting at, well, it's sitting a bit warmer now, like 13, but I had it down to five degrees. <laughs> um, and it was, I just, but my own self-reflection and, and, and anecdotal observations, I, I would be, I'm so clear in the day mm -hmm. from the cold water. Um even at the end of the, sh I do, you know, and then I get out and I get more out of my exercise. I do, a, again, not to be, never be as buff as big as you, but I do a little lightweight, you know, get myself going, look after my muscles going forward. I saw that. And, um, you know, uh, it, I just, I'm, I'm meant, I feel like I'm mentally prepared looking after my body for mine long term so I can stand up when I'm 65 and 70, you know, and thinking of being, trying to be proactive in mm -hmm. my, in my process and my thinking and my strategies and so on. But yeah. I've kind of lost it recently. The cold plunges I haven't, I've kind of stayed with that because I, I can see how mentally better prepared I am in the day, being yeah. present with my children. You know, I quit my job to become a casual teacher to do this, but to be present with them first yeah. and foremost. Um, and I, I'm a perfect, no, I'm, I'm, I'm far from perfect. There are moments go, damn, I should have spent that was five minutes rather than sending that post for leading our own way, you know? But yeah, no, you've just nailed a couple of things there for me. But, but yeah. everything in its season, you know, I feel a lot of people feel like they're letting themselves down when they're not being the, you know, the absolute um, exemplary. Uh, um, mm -hmm. uh, so I, I feel like if you can just um, uh, understand what works for you and know that you can always go back to it. You That's know, it. when, you know, understand that things happen in a season that, you know, you might have a couple of weeks that it's really busy or your, your mind's elsewhere or you're on holidays or, you know, your environment changes or the circumstances mm -hmm. in your life might be different. But you know that all of these things that are around you that, that have worked for you in the past will work for you again. That's yeah, it. they're all just tools. They can be taken off the shelf whenever you like and just and put straight back in and implement it again. And uh, you might not have had all of the benefits of it before, but all the benefits are still out there and waiting for you. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's uh, one of those things, you know, you, you know you'll, you'll get back into it and you'll find that nice little... Knee, uh, that nice little uh, uh, routine again that uh, just um, uh, propels you to where you want to go and uh, where the guilt might subside. Um, so uh, once again, and you'll, you'll feel like you're humming once more. Yeah, man. I agree. Thanks, Dave. Needed that. Yeah. <laughs> Don't be too hard on yourself. <laughs> um, you, well, you said you a minute ago, before, I, I, well, we'll move away from this, I promise, but you just said a minute ago about how you lie in a little bit more um, mm. Is that something that you don't want to do or are you quite happy just to lie in a little bit more before your oh, day starts? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, if I wasn't happy, I wouldn't be doing it. I, I okay. don't think it's uh, – yeah, it's not It's not like a slovenliness. It's almost like I'm going to give being a little bit lazy getting up a go almost. You know, mm. I'm just going to lie around a little bit more or um, there's not the same – uh, Russia, you know, there's times in your life where you kind of feel like I don't have two two seconds to spare, and and uh, you feel like you know every you know you really got to get up at five o'clock, or you're not going to fit all the things in. Mm. Um, and uh, you know, I'm not in that moment in my life at the moment, so uh, it's uh, it's um, it, I'm a little bit more relaxed with it. I'm not putting so much pressure on myself to uh, to be doing all of those things, and uh, um, and I'm just as happy about that. 
Oh, that's good. Because I'm not happy. <laughs> and I'm, I am lying around then a little bit longer and I'm like, yeah. no, I want to get up and do this. So I'm the opposite yeah. to you. <laughs> well, you know, some people are toward motivated people. Other people are away motivated people. And, you know, if you're not toward motivated towards it, it to, so you're not just getting up and jumping into it, then you might be an away motivated person that just needs something bad to happen to make you do stuff. So um, it might, you know, you might, I don't know. Uh, you know how a lot of people don't don't start eating really well until they're sick? You know, yeah. Mm. So uh, totally you know, took that to make it happen. They knew they should have been eating. They knew that before. You know, um, and uh, you know, even when they get a cold, you know, all of a sudden they're on the on the on the water and the you know the mm-hmm. the, the green tea and mm-hmm. uh, the the, the vegetable soup and yeah, all of that and not yeah. the vitamins, but yeah. Um, so uh, so yeah, it, it's just identifying that sometimes. So if you and if you're feeling bad about it, then you know you shouldn't be. You know your your your, your locus of control there is just suggesting to you that uh, you know you should be getting up, you should be doing something about this. You know, mm-hmm. so it's a, it's a, we're, we're experiencing the same thing, we're just feeling differently about it. Yeah. So, yeah. And uh, and how you feel about it is what's most important. By the way, you know, it's not what's actually happening. No one, nobody cares if you lie in for an hour. No, no one's no one's going to care in a hundred years. It doesn't matter. It's how you feel about it. So if you feel like you're missing out by not getting up, or you're not you're not being in alignment with those values that you were talking about earlier by by not committing, then uh, you know you either got to give up on the values or you've you've got to step up your in your obligations. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, totally. No, I agree. Oh, and then you feel better. I'm on my challenge for tomorrow morning now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I'm going to disappoint Dave if I don't do it. Oh, well. Yeah, yeah. I'll be watching. Yeah, just a little. <laughs> um, <laughs> Get the picture up. I had a good question to ask you, and I've completely gone blank now. Um, you, you, I will, if it comes back to me, I, 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 will, I will bring it up. Uh, so I'll I'll apologise now if I cut you off. But you just said you're. Um, this is not it, by the way. The, the mm-hmm. other, I've got a million things flowing through my mind. But you just mentioned you um you, you, about motivation. Have you always been motivated? I feel like I've always been motivated. Mm-hmm. I, I don't. I don't. I feel like. Um, um, I feel like I've been somebody who's had potential and not necessarily lived up to it as well as I could have. Mm-hmm. Though, so. Why? Um, uh, but I, you know, understanding that you might have potential is enough to get, keep you motivated most of the time. I feel like uh, when people are feeling a bit depressed or a bit down or whatever, they just underestimate their own potential a little bit, uh, and so as a result, they're not living up to them their own expectations of themselves. Um, so uh, yeah, so I, I feel like I've I've had a a healthy um, sense of motivation in most as- aspects of my life. And a, and a belief that I can be good at most things I, I give a go at um, doesn't doesn't necessarily mean I'm, I'm great at any of those things, but I, I have a confidence that I'll be good at most things I try. Mm-hmm. Where did where did that come from? Do you think? Um, I, I I think um, uh, my mum instilled that you know you, you're good at anything you give a go. At. I think you just you're very receptive to what people say to you when you're very young so you know it's uh, that's something that's just instilled i don't feel like that's uh, anything that i've ever really doubted yeah mm. you, you you brought up your childhood at the beginning of the episode um where you you mentioned about you didn't come from a very good um education background your area that you lived in i don't know your area that you live in very well i've, I've only been mm. through adelaide once or twice yeah well, if you went through that bit, you would have wanted to keep your doors locked and your windows up. Uh, I am from Manchester, uh, not disputing. Oh, uh, <laughs> you might have been at home then. Um, so, <laughs> no, my Manchester area is pretty good, just so you know. But there are parts you drive through, you know. Yeah. Oh well, uh, where I grew up was a. Um, it's a satellite city outside of Adelaide um, called Elizabeth. That's um, where a lot of the um, English migrants went after the war, and um, then by the time the nineteen eighties rolled around, it was uh, it had fallen into. Um, uh, I would say um, very much a, a. It was meant to be a working class area, and it it, it, it was very much a sub working class area. It became a an area where you know you lived if you couldn't afford to live anywhere else. Essentially, so a lot of government housing. We we lived in a government um, uh, housing uh, property. It was a two bedroom duplex, um, just uh, touched by the party wall. Um, we didn't have a, a, any you know, concrete paths or air conditioning or even a driveway, which didn't matter because we didn't have a car. So uh, the um, 
and and the edu- quality of education, of course. People, you know, and I, I, I've heard people say over the years, oh, it doesn't really matter. They're all public schools. It does. It, it does have an impact, um, and uh, you, and it certainly did in our case. So uh, by the time we got through to high school, the, the, we by year level um, had the lowest pass rate and the lowest attendance rate uh, in our state for that that particular year. So um, even if I'd performed well, which I didn't particularly perform well, but even if I had performed well, uh, in the subjects that I did do well in, um, my marks were so poorly moderated down that it would have made um, acceptance at a, at a university impossible. So uh, mm. I knew that that was not going to be an option to me um, or for me. Um, so, um, uh, so yeah, so um, I, I never really quite knew what I was going to do as I was growing up. Um, I did have ambitions of being a professional golfer because I was a handy golfer. And I do remember sitting with um, a student counsellor, as, as you do in those year 10 or 11 meetings, and uh, and the, the student counsellor said, oh, so what do you want to do when you, when you grow up? And I said, oh, I want, I want to be a professional golfer. And the and student counsellor, hmm, and leant over and, Picked up a brochure for working at the Holden's factory, which was at the end of the street from where our school was, and said, oh, so have you ever considered a career working at Holden's? And I went, uh, I hadn't really, but I you know, guess I'll give up on that dream of playing golf and let's yeah. look at this. She's and putting, the she's joke putting there, you off. <laughs> joke there being that at, at, um, a lot of my friends did work at Holden's and, and were earning really good money. I mean, the, those guys were, were doing great in terms of factory work. It was fantastic and almost uh, by the time – uh, I've gotten into my early twenties. A, a lot of my friends that worked at Holden's had already uh, were buying their own homes and uh, setting themselves up, and were getting married and doing doing those things in life. And uh, and I, I looked at that quite enviously, and um, I thought I'd try and get a job at Holden's now. Mm. And uh, I couldn't get a job at Holden's. I couldn't pass the manual dexterity test. So I, I tried twice and and failed on two occasions. Uh, I got two left thumbs. I, got, I just literally could not do the physical work with with the uh, as quickly and uh, with the attention to detail that was required of being a factory worker. I just I couldn't do it. So um, I did end up getting a job um, working for Balfour's, which is a big commercial bakery here in South Australia. And uh, it's like working in a factory, but uh, I was a baker's assistant and uh, getting up in the early, early morning um, hours and uh, uh, 2, 2 a.m. and 3 a.m. and, and uh, working in the dark for eight hours in the in the cellar of a of an old building with rats running around <laughs> it, 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 I, I just remember this uh this one morning I was just covered in cake mix and uh and uh just just thinking I, I can't do this for the rest of my life this is awful and uh I, I just want to get dressed up I just want to wear nice clothes I just want to, you know, I, just, I, I wasn't qualified for anything but I just wanted to be all dressy I did I was too prissy for that for that uh, line of work and um I thought what am I going to do how am I going to get myself out of here and it's like well I'm gonna I'm gonna have to s- probably sell stuff you know so uh, well if I'm going to sell something it might as well be something big it's going to be cars or houses and uh so well uh uh, I'll give selling cars a go. My dad had done that for years, and I was a, a, a bit estranged from my dad. I, you know, you get that sense that, well, if my dad did, at least I, I, I should be able to do it. And uh, so um, I got a job selling cars and, and was very good at it. Um, the chap that um, I worked for hadn't sold a car in months, um, three or four months, and uh, I sold like 10 cars in two weeks. So very quickly I had that confidence of, ooh, okay. Um, I'm not bad. I had good product knowledge with cars because I really like cars, but it was more. I was very good with the people. Uh, that 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 seemed to come very naturally, and I um, had a, a strong sense as to. Um, uh, I wasn't necessarily selling them the cars. It's like selling a house. You can't sell somebody a house they don't want. You can't sell them a car they don't. Well, maybe you can in some cases, but you can't really sell somebody something they don't want. But you can make them feel a whole lot more comfortable about buying it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, um, so I got really good at that, and uh, very very quickly, and um, realised that there might be um, something in that idea of selling houses. And so, um, went along and uh, applied for a job that uh, previous. Uh, girlfriend uh, at the time had also gone for and uh, and she didn't get that job but I did and um, well that was the the start of the career and 
the end of the relationship in some respects. I was going to ask. Yeah. <laughs> Not I exactly. Ho- no, no. She was. Uh, I, 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 <laughs> that, that's more a joke than anything else. But yeah. the relationship did end shortly, shortly thereafter, and and all, all, all because of my reasons. Not nothing to do with her. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> it's just that, just to clarify, uh, she's listening. Everyone. Yeah, it was just yeah, just in case. Yeah, so it, it, it was all it was all on my end. I, I was the bad boyfriend. There was no doubt. But uh, yeah, and um, but it was the start of a, a it was something that. Uh, uh, like I felt like I didn't have any options, and I think in that makes you dig deep and make the most of that that one opportunity that you've got. And uh, and to be honest, I didn't even get uh, the job the first time I went for it. Like they actually lit- they went with somebody else, and uh, that person dropped out, and so I was the the, the number two, you know. So um, I was grateful to get that call back though, and uh, I got that job, and um, and it was tough for the first couple of years. I mean, it was not financially rewarding at all for many years. Um, back then, you know, salespeople didn't even get paid a decent basic wage, um, so it was uh, financially it was very very difficult. And there were moments that I didn't think I was necessarily going to continue on, um, but uh, you know, I'm glad I did, and tough to out and found some great people around me that uh, really helped me um, make a career of it and understand that this was a place I needed to be if I was to actually uh, have a great life. It was probably the only place I could do it. Yeah. What, what you, you mentioned about the pay. What was the typical pay back then? I, I think my first year in real estate, I earned $13,000. Wow. Um, so um, back then they had what was a, a credit debit system. There was no um, safeguards in place. It was, there was no salary or anything mm. like that. So, uh, you know, you might sell all these houses and then you have all this money deducted for advertising. And then it, it was all a bit squirrely back then. I know they've reformed the industry since. And so the, these stories aren't, uh, aren't out there or shouldn't be out there anymore. But um, back then it was just kind of normal. You know, if you, um, you'd never quite knew what you were going to get paid. <laughs> it was, was the truth. Um, but, um, uh, I say I found myself in a in a in a night in a great space uh, to to work at the right time for me and uh, and you know they gave me a great platform and a and wonderful opportunity and and good stability in my life and exactly the time that I needed it and um, Andrew uh, Harvey and Francis Lim were the people that gave me that opportunity back then they they really did um, provide me with a springboard that um, set me up for the rest of my life as as a result of encouraging me to work there so I'm very How long very grateful did you work to them. In- how long did you work for somebody else before you set up um, your own? So um, I, well, I started in real estate when I was 21. I opened uh, a business in a partnership when I was 30. So, uh, and, um, and then uh, went on my own probably two or so years after that. So, uh, so what's that? That's, um, yeah, 32. So that's 16 years ago. Yeah. 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 And during that time before all of, um, before your professional life started, do you have any other passions growing up at all? Oh yeah. I, was, I, I enjoyed golf. My, my grandfather was, uh, was an avid, uh, weekend golfer. And, uh, uh, so, um, I, I, I got, uh, I got the bug early on and, uh, mm-hmm. and really enjoyed that. Um, uh, I was a bit average at, uh, you know, other sports, soccer and golf and that, that type of thing. Um, uh, always enjoyed performing. Um, I, I was a I was a professional dancer at one stage, um, uh, which was just a. That's it cool. wasn't a long career, and it wasn't a well paid one, but uh, I did get paid once. Um, what kind so- of dancer? It was like it was just jazz ballet. It was just uh, our school had a performance group that um, did a lot of um, extracurricular stuff. So got the opportunity to go on tour and do some private events and stuff with them and. That was interesting. Went along to the Johnny Young Talent School at one point when I was younger. My mum thought I had had potential to to be on telly and to be one of those uh, all singing or dancing wow. children. And uh, I, I I didn't that that hand eye coordination. Uh, everybody's turning left, I'm turning right. I'm not the best at it. I was good as a lead uh, dancer when I didn't have to conform with what was going on around me so much. But when, <laughs> when it, there's a pattern here. But Dave. when it came to yeah yeah, um, so uh, <laughs> exactly. Um, um, it, my favourite quote is the Mark Twain quote. You know, when, when on the side of the majority, it's time to pause and reflect. Unfortunately, that was also the case when dancing. Um, so uh, that's hilarious. Um, so, um, but yeah, uh, so that was that was a, an in- interesting chapter. To be honest, I, I never really had a particular passion for it. But again, it was just one of those things that. I felt like I was good at it, and so I just played it out and uh, saw where it might lead me, and uh, and, it, and it might have influenced me in terms of um, being a performer and being an auctioneer and, and yeah. ultimately doing this 
uh, the re-announcing and the podcasting and what we're doing with uh, AWE with uh, with our arm wrestling promotion. Yeah, because there's an element of performing in all of those things that you're doing, right? Yeah, that that may be the common thread. Yeah, yeah. for sure. But you, you you played it down. But you you made it as a professional dancer. You got paid, so you must have been pretty goddamn good to to get to a certain point in that. Oh uh, well, um, <laughs> maybe. You obviously were. <laughs> Not good enough to kick along. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> so one, uh, one of my other guests um, that I've uh, interviewed is, used to be a professional salsa dancer at Madison Square Garden, believe it or not. Well, I wasn't at that standard, I can tell you. <laughs> He's not salsa dancing anymore, let me tell you. <laughs> Sorry? He's not salsa dancing anymore. No, okay. <laughs> but he, he runs the. He does run a lot of salsa dance nights in in New York City still to this day, though. Oh. Um, one of the, probably the number one um, setup in that area. Um, it's interesting. Yeah, yeah I, very I no, interesting. He no, sells no good as an arm wrestler, but I love being around arm wrestling, and so yeah. you know, that, organizing arm wrestling events and and promoting uh, arm wrestling events is my way of being in the sport without yeah being in the sport. That's what I'm doing right now. I, I, I don't get to speak to anyone here, so I get to speak to people like you by doing a podcast, you know? <laughs> people, those photos were up and said, oh, these are all my friends. Is That's it? it? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Um, of every guest. <laughs> Put them on another wall. It'll cost me a lot of money in frames, let me tell you. Yeah. Uh, you'd actually get along with my, uh, the, that guest because he, he sold uh, how I met him. I, I met him in a shop called Bo Brummel in Soho, Manhattan. He sells suits. Oh, right. Um, and you, you're wearing some dashing suits in your photos. Uh, what, you. Probably a perfect prompt to bring this one up. There's another one of you. <laughs> yep, that's uh, I, another DFC event. That's uh, actually the most recent DFC, DFC 19. I wish so, I could pull um, off wearing a suit like that, by the way. Yeah, thank you, uh, Milat from Lemmy Largo, for all of his wonderful support. Yeah, that's great. Great photo. And, and obviously in your daily life, you probably, I mean, I've got another picture here. I, I, not, I mean, I, I would have spread it out, but whilst we're on the subject of be looking dapper, um, <laughs> very stylish with the shirt and the hat and the, Thank you. And the tie. I like it. Yep. Very cool. Yeah. And I've noticed that is one of your profile pictures, I think. Oh, is it? I think so. Oh, right. <laughs> on, 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 when you phoned me earlier, that's how it came up anyway. Oh, that's what, is that the one now, is it? Oh, <laughs> yeah. there you go. Yeah. <laughs> um. Sorry, that echoed really loud then in my ear. Um, so you you had a few other jobs growing up uh, in your before you started uh, into real estate. You mentioned uh, in our pre chat about uh, working in. Uh, you mentioned the bakery before, but did you mention? Did you bring up the pub? I think. I, no, I don't think I did. But I did work at a pub. Uh, yeah. I, I worked at uh, Big W and uh, over Christmas, like a lot of kids do. And yeah. after that, um, it was. Um, I say I didn't have much of an education. There weren't too many opportunities around, and that was the recession. That was uh, uh, the early nineteen nineties, and so uh, full time jobs were few and far between. And mm. um, if you weren't um, in my area, if you weren't lucky enough to get a job at Holden's, the, the, you were probably not getting a job. Um, and uh, so, um, and I was kind of caught there where um, after Christmas I still hadn't had a job and and weren't getting too many uh, opportunities. And um, uh, but. Um, uh, through um, a, a, the grapevine, heard of a, an opportunity, um, had a, a friend of a friend, a family friend, um, kind of put in a good word with me and got me a got me a, a, an interview to a, 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 to work at a pub cleaning up. So my job was cleaning up all the bars uh, the the morning after. Uh, the night before, and so it was uh, back then. Of course, you know people were smoking inside all the time. Mm. So my job was to to clean the light bulbs of all the nicotine. So I had to warm up the light globes enough so that the nicotine would drip, so I could wipe the the, <laughs> the wow. light globes. That was my job, and, and empty out all the all the empty bottles and and sort through all of that and mop up all behind the bars and get all the kegs ready. And and uh, and so uh, you know, for um, there, there was a great deal of. Um, humility in that because uh you know i would never really got my hands dirty as such and didn't didn't really you know it was maybe a little bit oh I, I don't know i don't want to really touch that but you know after you've mopped up somebody's spew a couple of times a, a day for for a week or so you kind of you, you you drop that pretty quickly and uh um and it was a really good grounding in life it wasn't particularly well paid i think my first uh, paycheck i, I got 174 dollars and 50 cents for my 38 hours of, of work and um 
um, but uh, you know, I worked between eight and about uh, four o'clock in the afternoon, and um, and uh, uh, it was uh, it was a very interesting grounding in life too. I mean, you see the best and worst of people in hotels, and and you soon be, uh, find a way to be able to get along with most people because you really have to, and you you don't. You also understand not to judge a book by its cover because you know you you'll you'll have you know the the the, the homeless drunks that will come through who who will come through for for a drink and then you'll have some of the wealthiest people in your in your town also come through that same bar at the same time and uh, and you you can start to learn that people are people it doesn't seemingly matter what they have they've all got problems um, and uh, and if you're that person that they can talk to about those problems then uh, you're probably their friend um, and or they'll certainly think of you as an ally and so um, at the age of 16 17 uh, those life skills have really set me up for what it is that I do now which uh, essentially is negotiating with grown-ups over something that's really important which is where they're going to live um, and spend maybe the rest of their lives. So, yeah, there's a lot of life lessons just from that small thing. You know, I, I don't think as an educator, I don't know about you, but what do you think of where we're sending our children into the, into the future now? You know, I don't feel like we're preparing them for the real world as best as we possibly can. That job alone at the pub gave you so many, I don't want to even say life skills, human skills. It's probably the mm. better way of putting it. You know what I mean? Like we have yeah. had that discussion today are we model calling our children too much? Are we trying to protect them with a safety net too much? Mm -hmm. You know, should I be advising my son, go and get a job in a pub, go and clean up, but he's going to look at me like I'm crazy. But it served you very, very, very well. And it was a, I think it's a great piece of um, mm. reflection. Yeah, well, I mean, there was no, well, I guess, it, you know, here's the thing, like for me, I had to go get a job. You know, um, I, my mother wasn't uh, in a position to be able to support me now that, I, you know, I was uh, out of school. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so uh, you know there was I was compelled to um, I think a lot of children these days um, are they're not compelled to go and work early on there's not a reason to I think um, I, I was fortunate enough to uh, hear from a demographer um, that um, adulthood um, in 1910 uh, started at 14 uh, so childhood went to 12. Adolescence went to fourteen, and then adulthood kicked uh, kicked on from there. And you know, if um, if you had to, you had to be the breadwinner at fourteen, um, and uh, and away you went. And they might be working in a factory or doing whatever you needed to do to put uh, food on the table uh, potentially. Um, and that wasn't unusual. But certainly by sixteen, you're expected to you know be ready to pull your own weight, um, and uh, that's not the expectation now. Now adolescence lasts till thirty. Join us tomorrow to hear more from today's incredible guests and learn valuable insights to help you lead your own way. Don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you then.